Hi, everyone. Let's see here. I'm going to go over here. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today and to share with you uh, what we're working on at Ocean, as well as opportunities that you might find interesting with respect to this emerging data economy. Let's get started. So back in 2008, you all probably remember there was a financial crisis. Um, a lot of um, bad things happened. Uh, for example, there was lines of people outside banks um, because the banks were shutting down and they wanted to get their money. But of course, not your keys, not your money. So they didn't get their money in very many cases. That led directly to the creation of Bitcoin, which sparked um, the opening up of money. So we went from this um, previous uh, economy of money, um, sh a shadow money economy, controlled by the Fed, controlled by the banks. And now this token economy that has been emerging um, is really about being transparent and permissionless. So the token economy is opening up money. And um, it's led to an explosion of opportunity. This very conference here is a, is a wonderful example. The trade show out there, um, two ballrooms worth of, worth of keynotes and talks and so on. Um, and you know, billions and billions of dollars worth of value created. And we're, we're still just at the very, very beginning. Um, and in this um, economy, uh, this token economy, you can view it as really three levels. There's the base layer where we have a reserve currency. Um, Bitcoin, people will argue, is that's a bit the reserve currency of the, the token economy. Um, there's an app platform with a unit of exchange. Um, Ethereum and several others have emerged, as well as a funding platform for things like ICOs and this sort of thing. Um, once again, Ethereum and many things. On top of that, we have the utility last mile. This is the apps. And on as well, on top, we have the economic last mile. And uh, once again, you'll see many of those booths out there with things like custodians and wallets, whether it's um, uh, in the cloud, things like Coinbase, the hardware wallets, uh, or your software wallets, uh, Tracer and MetaMask, respectively. We've got the exchanges, and we've got the mining. So all of these are elements of this emerging token economy. This isn't meant to be a complete picture, but it kind of gives you a feel for what this looks like. This, this relates later, as you will see. So, so that's the token economy. It's opened up money. Now let's talk about data. I was at the UN last December and stood on stage and gave a talk about data. And right before me, I was pretty happy because uh, a woman who is one of the leaders at the World Bank stood up and talked about how the digital economy is a data-driven economy. And she, she gave some quotes. Um, in 2016, the global digital economy, it's worth more than $11 trillion. It's huge, right? And it's growing so much that it, it will be one quarter of the world economy in less than a decade. So we all know that the digital economy is huge. Here's the kicker, and it was really cool to see that the World Bank themselves was saying this. Data is the fuel of the digital economy. The digital economy, this $11 trillion industry, is being driven by data. A year ago, The Economist published a, um, a headline article about data. Data as oil. Data as the world's most valuable resource. Many of the world's largest companies, uh, four of the top 10, are actually based on data. We've got Amazon, Google, Facebook, Uber, and, and the like. And the thing is, it's a pretty closed economy right, right now. Uh, Facebook is buying their data from others and keeping it for themselves. Same thing with Google, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a closed economy. It's opaque, and that power is concentrated among a small number of organizations and individuals. But we have an inspiration. The token economy. The token economy opened up money. Can we do the same thing for data? Can we move from this shadow data economy where they, that is opaque with concentrated power and move to a Web3 data economy and a transparent, permissionless data economy while retaining privacy, of course? That's the question we've been asking. And we might also ask, what might it look like? And today I'm going to talk to you a bit about how it has a base layer, an economic layer, uh, of reserve currency and the like. It has a utility last mile, data science tools and the like. And finally, an economic last mile, which is really surprising and interesting. And I'm going to explore that here. And of course, in this data economy, the, eco the opportunities are going to explode. Just like in 2008, 2009, we got Bitcoin. Well, now we have um, the emergence of a fundamental base layer for the data economy, and we see that on top of that, we will see many, many, many opportunities with respect to custodians for data, exchanges for data, mining around data and other services, utility to last mile, and so on and so forth. And so we're very excited about this. And uh, this talk, I'm going to be elaborating on that. 
So the first question is, if we're going to have a data economy, we need to unlock the data. So how do we go about doing this? And this was the very, very first question we started asking when we were working on Ocean. How do we unlock the data? Um, the demand side is easy. AI and many other um, techniques really want the data. So there's high demand. It's just very hard to unlock. How do you do it? So there's two ways. One way is connect the data haves with the data wants. Now, inside every Fortune 500 company and many other enterprises, et cetera, they all have tons of data. But for most of them, it's just sitting there latent. It's gathering dust. People inside, they kind of have this feeling that their data is valuable, but they're really, really scared of letting it go, of, of, um, of losing control, of um, getting fined because of GDPR and other privacy laws and so on. At the same time, you've got a whole bunch of AI experts that are in AI startups or in universities and so on, and they're starving for data. They really want data, or even just basic analytics. And there's very, very, very little overlap between these people who have the data and the people who want the data. You know what the overlap is? It's the companies that have created tremendous value by using AI to extract value from data, Google, Facebook, and the like. So the question we've been asking is, can we merge these? Can, can we connect the data haves, the enterprises with all this latent data, with all of these AI folks who know how to extract value from the data? And we believe that connecting this with a connective substrate a public utility network that no one owns or controls is the path. So let's flesh this out of what this can look like. The goal is to reduce the friction to connect these data haves with the data have nots. And that is via data marketplaces. So on the left, we've got a whole economy of data marketplaces, not one data marketplace, but a bunch. If you have just a, data, a single data marketplace, centralized or decentralized, it's going to be a data silo. So you need a whole bunch of these. And then um, the enterprises and other organizations with lots of data are feeding into this. You know, government open data initiatives, NGOs with dreams, dreams and dreams of data. On the other side, you have the data scientists and the analysts with their Excel spreadsheets and so on. And they're actually using their tools. They're using Excel, they're using data science tools like scikit-learn and so on. And underneath, you have a connective substrate that uh, makes it really easy to build the data marketplaces. And then that feeds directly into the data science tools, into things like Jupyter Notebook and other interactive tools. So that's the goal, is to reduce the friction, to create these marketplaces, to make it really easy, where they have massive liquidity of data at the bottom, a supply of data for everyone. What's really cool, once you have that, then you have another benefit that comes for free. You can do internal data sharing with provenance. So this substrate, at the heart of it, it's really about decentralized access control and decentralized orchestration to be a bit more general. But then what you can have is you have internal data sharing. So let's say you've got a big multinational corporation with one um, branch here in Hong Kong, another branch in Berlin, another branch in New York, and you want to share the data. That can be very, very hard. And you can also run into data privacy issues. You know, the data in Berlin can't leave German soil if it has any personal information on it, for example. So how do you actually make that accessible to share the data? And um, this connective substrate is actually what makes that possible combined with the second thing I'll talk about. So the second thing is you unlock the private data while preserving privacy. So let's talk about private data. The most valuable data is the private data. It's sitting there behind the files. People don't want to release it precisely because they know it's valuable. So private and valuable go hand in hand. The, th the thing is, let's say you're a bank, right? And you want to predict um, the stocks or to do trading, to do better trading, or an insurance company. Um, and ideally, you could somehow get all the data of your competitors even to build a really, really great model to do prediction, or, or maybe for credit card de um, fraud detection or otherwise, right? So there's the data that you have, but you really want you know, 100x or 1,000x that data. That would be the ideal. Now here's the problem, privacy, right? So you can't do this. This is an absolute no-no. It's show-stopping, thanks to things like GDPR and so on. And GDPR is a really great thing, especially for the consumer. Uh, I, I stand fully behind it. From a business perspective, if you want to extract value from AI, that's the challenge. So more data means both good things and bad things. Good things because you have more accurate models, which mean you can have better business value, you know, sell more ads, have a lower fraud, et cetera. But it also means that privacy is going down and the, the, uh, the uh, exposure surface for exploits is going up. Right? And we have all these hacks of things like Equifax with 300 million credit cards and so on and so forth. So um, you know, every single big entity in, the sense, in a sense is a giant data honeypot. No one likes that. So here's the solution. Bring the compute to the data. You can unlock the value 
of the data while preserving privacy. So you, what you have is you have a decentralized layer in the middle, Ocean, which does orchestration of these various computing steps. You've got the private data behind a firewall. You privately train your model, whether it's a neural network or something else, with a modeling algorithm supplied by the user. You store the private model there, and then you ask the model for predictions. And only the predictions go up to the final user. So here, we're extracting the value from the data itself without exposing any of the personally identifiable information. So we're actually resolving this fundamental paradox. We, we can have way more data for accuracy and business value, but at the same time, preserving the privacy. This is a really big step. So this is the, what Ocean is about, is about unlocking the data to uh, unleash this open, transparent data economy that preserves privacy. As we've been working on Ocean in the last couple of years, we've been starting to engage with various partners um, on use cases. So you can say, this is what the beginning of a data economy looks like. Let's go through a few. Uh, one vertical is automotive. So one challenge in there is, is autonomous driving. We know that with autonomous driving, we can um, eliminate the 1.2 million deaths per year from uh, car accidents um, if these uh, cars get way more accurate than humans, which they promise to. The challenge is they need 500 billion miles driven. Toyota did an analysis and they realized that it would take them 20 years to get that much data. And they realized they needed to share their data among Toyota, GM, BMW, Ford, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they formed an, an alliance called Mobi. And Mobi is actually representative of 70% of the world's auto production. We've been working with them since actually about a year before their inception. Um, and the CEO of Mobi, Chris Ballinger, uh, has been a collaborator, and to quote him, he's proud to support us and our collaborators towards autonomous driving. So this is one use case that we're very, very proud of and working very closely towards. Another one is health. So um, as an example, a friend of mine, he's a researcher in genetic programming. He's building AI models for cancer. He tells me he's a happy man if he builds a model off of a data set of 100 people. This is genetic data, so there's thousands of variables. What that means, the model is terrible. He can hardly predict anything. But imagine instead of predict making a model off of 100 data points, you make a model off of 100 million. Now, normally that would be a giant data honeypot and it would be a privacy no-no. But um, with Ocean, you can actually um, re resolve the privacy issue by learning across the different silos at once. So in this particular case, we are working with a, a, an organization called Connected Life. And they are collaborating with TU Munich and other universities um, for chronic diseases. They're focusing on Parkinson's, Parkinson's to start. And then after that, um, other diseases as well, the various forms of cancer, uh, Alzheimer's, and so on. And they're doing two things. They have a trustless sharing environment between health data providers and consumers, as well as a, a data commons marketplace. Another vertical is the government of Singapore. Um, and in particular, their AI Singapore department. So we are working with them on research collaboration to help train up their next generation of engineers um, for decentralized AI and data sharing, building data models in a privacy-preserving fashion. And um, so this is very useful strategically for governments because, um, to quote uh, Alexander Wisner Gross, AI advances six times faster when data is available. So if you can take um, this insight and apply it on a national scale where you've actually got great access to a nation um, by having more data, then it, it's actually um, a, a, an excellent AI strategy at national levels. We're also working with the government of Singapore's data authorities called IMDA. And this is really about sandboxes for a regulatory fast lane. So many Fortune 500 companies are headquartered um, in Singapore. And so within those headquarters, they're um, going to be running sandboxes where they don't have to have every regulatory solution up front. They can run sandboxes for several months or even a year. And once everything is fine from a privacy perspective and so on, they can, then they can unleash to the broader world. And this allows them to iterate with new ideas and new technologies very quickly. Another example is in the world of retail. Um, there, Next Billion and Unilever are working with us. Um, and the idea is that there's these rural shops, like the one pictured here, uh, in rural India. And they, have, uh, they ha sell, um, say, $1,000 worth of um, goods every month. Um, the Unilevers of the world want to be able to know what to sell these shops. And they have no insight. There's no Nielsen ratings for this. So Next Billion is uh, supplying applications for the people running these shops to, to say what, what they're selling all the time, supply that to Unilever. Unilever is paying for this as data, which is very valuable. And at the end of the day, the margins uh, for the shop owners go up as much as 4x, which is actually quite remarkable. Another example is agriculture. Um, so Syngenta is working to help small farmers manage their plots. So how do you allocate your fertilizer better? 
um, you know, more in some places, less than in other places, rather than uniform across the board. And this, in turn, also helps to protect biodiversity. Uh, and we have many other collaborators, too. Uh, Aviva, Roche, Johnson & Johnson, ST Micro, and more. Uh, we're also working with other governments uh, and, and other foundations, such as AIX Prize, AI for Good Foundation, Grow Asia, IXO, and more. So going back, uh, you know, we, uh, now you've seen what this data economy is starting to look like. We're just at the very beginning of this open, transparent, permissionless data economy. And you might ask yourself, OK, um, is there something in it for me? What can I do? And we're really at the very beginning. This is 2008, 2009, 2010 in, in token land. That's where we're at for data land right now. So uh, if you recall, I've talked about how there was the, the token economy. And we've seen this explosion and all this opportunity, you know, billions and billions of wealth created. Now, right now, um, this, we've got this new data economy that is just emerging. And I've given a sampling of some use cases. So at the base layer, we've got Ocean. And it actually, um, the way that Ocean is designed, it plays the role of store of value, as well as unit of exchange, as well as apps platform. But one level up, this is where we have the data science tools. And so uh, already Ocean has integration into Jupyter, which is the de facto standard interface that data scientists around the world are starting to use. And Jupyter itself ties into things like TensorFlow and Scikit-Learn, all these things for things like neural networks and the like. Um, and we envision integrations with many, many other tools, too, um, uh, leveraging you know, at the core level things like Python, TensorFlow directly, and so on. Now, here's the interesting part, the last financial mile. This is unbounded opportunity. Um, just like we see these trade show booths out here for the token economy, imagine five years from now, we have a conference like this where there is a, a conference filled with trade show booths around data, um, data custodians, data wallets, data exchanges, and generalized mining for, for data. So here, let's talk about generalized mining. You know, mining and Bitcoin and so on is really about building these ASICs, the bit, bit mains of the world, and uh, generating money there. Within Ocean, this is actually more about data services. So it's making data available, storing data, as well as compute. So uh, as examples from the Web3 world are things like Polkadot at Web3 Foundation, Filecoin, Storage, S3, as well as um, the compute side, Enigma for privacy preserving, compute, TrueBit. We had a talk earlier today from Singularity Net and so on. And finally, we actually have the Web2 world, for example, Azure and, and Amazon. So this is really generalized mining, and there's going to be a lot of opportunities just in that. But these other um, w um, bullets are, are fascinating, too. So now, if you think about crypto wallets, you've got a My Ether wallet, or you've got your Trezor. Now you can use this to store and secure data, right? So before, we talk about data security, where you hope that your CIO or your sysadmin is taking care of it, right? Many, many levels down in the stack. Now it's not your keys, not your data, right? So whoever has the keys controls the data. And, and so um, there's way more tokens before. And it's basically data security meeting token security. We're going to have hardware wallets. We're going to have paper wallets. We're going to have custodians, all of this, just for data, this trillion dollar economy that data will be. Also, in the world of data exchanges, so you might ask yourself, we have had token exchanges. We have th the Binances of the world, the GDAXs, and so on. Well, imagine if they start to adapt their technology to data exchanges. And with data, there's tens of thousands, millions of data sets. So right now, we might think we have a long tail of tokens for uh, blockchain projects, you know, 1,000, 2,000 tokens. Well, we're going to be ending up with 100,000 or a million tokens, one token per data set in the world of data. And there's going to be a long tail, and it's going to be um, very exciting. So there's going to be way more tokens to sell. And, um, but it's not going to be quite specifically the same thing as, as, data, as token exchanges. Some of those data sets will be fungible. Some will be non-fungible. Some might even have better payments with things like royalties and the like. So we're going to see all sorts of variety just around data itself. And we can keep going. Uh, within Ethereum and other communities, we're starting to see this explosion of DeFi with things like market makers, Uniswap, or stable coins like MakerDAO. Well, now we can have data economy market makers. We can have stable coins that are backed by data. You know, if we've got a trillion dollars worth of data assets, why not make a stable coin backed in that? If the future digital economy is a data economy, why not make a stable coin backed by that? And also, you know, we have the Dharmas of the world, which is about tokenized debt. Well, we can have data debts. We can have data insurance. Everything that we see emerging for the token economy will mirror into the data economy. How is that for exciting?
And of course, some people are starting to see the opportunities. So for example, DCI, Digital Commerce Intelligence, as well as Connected Life and others, they're starting to build data marketplaces on top of Ocean. You know, Ocean is out there. You can go to docs.oceanprotocol.com and start building data marketplaces, data commons, integrating to your favorite data science tools. You can do that today. The beta is coming out in two weeks, production to follow shortly after. So to conclude, the token economy opened money. We all, all we have to do is look behind us and see. The Web3 data economy opens data while retaining privacy. And with that, we get an unbounded explosion of opportunities with data custodians, data wallets, data exchanges, generalized mining, and more. How is that for exciting? Thank you.